Vita brings this really unique perspective. You know, I, I, when I read your essay, I thought, wow, here, here you are, uh, a woman who was born in the state of Israel, Palestine, you were no, you were born outside the state of Israel. You come to Galilee, you, ha you become a citizen of the state of Israel, and then you choose to move to Ramallah. So you bring at least three perspectives and probably many, many more to this, this issue of occupation and of what it's like to try to have a life, right? And what it means for this 50-year occupation in terms of a person who is crossing through these sectors. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that perspective, the unique perspective that you bring to this issue. And in particular, as I said earlier on, um, and I promise we will all buy the book, we, if, even if you spoil what you're writing in it for us now. But I'm really fascinated by this notion that after Oslo, you go back in. So um, I know that we only have a few minutes, but if you could tell us your life story and your perspective, <laughs> that would be very helpful because I think it's utterly unique. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I, I always tell people it's difficult to tell my story without telling my dad's story. Uh, my father's name is Sabri Jirias. He was, um, or he is a lawyer, and he was uh, one of the uh, founders of one of the first resistance, Palestinian resistance movements uh, in the 1950s, uh, 1960s. Um, of course, he was born in 1938 in what was then Palestine in a village called Fasuta in the Galilee. We are only about seven kilometers from the Lebanese border, so we are way, way up north. Um, as a result of my, and he, he carried on, he, uh, um, he went to the Terra Sancta School in Nazareth, and he went on to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he studied law. At the time, all the Palestinians uh, in Israel were living under uh, military uh, governance, which basically meant that to move anywhere, um, you had to have permits which today is like the situation in the West Bank. Um, he carried on, he became a political activist, he studied law, he was working to prevent the seizure of Arab lands by the newly created uh, State of Israel. Uh, of course, at the time we had had uh, close to a million people, 85% of the Palestinian population of what, you know, what had become Israel at the time had been uh, displaced to Lebanon, Syria, and the, and the surrounding countries in a massive uh, refugee crisis. He was working to try to save the lands of those uh, who remained. As a result of his work, uh, you know, he was being detained and hassled, and ultimately he was exiled. Uh, he had to leave to Lebanon, where I was born. Um, he worked as the director of the Palestine Research Center of the PLO, uh, working on political, uh, social um, uh, research, and so on. And in 1982, uh, uh, there was the Israeli uh, invasion of uh, Beirut. In 1983, I lost my mother who worked with him in the Palestine uh, uh, Research Center in a bombing, uh, you know, that was targeting uh, the center at the time. We moved to Cyprus. Uh, we stayed there until 1994. And then in a turn of events, none of us, none of us had actually even thought would happen. Um, the Oslo Accords we were, were signed, and I remember we were all sitting in our living room in Nicosia in Cyprus, staring at the TV in shock at the historic handshake um, between, you know, uh, Mr. Rabin and Mr. Arafat at the time. And uh, sure enough, a year later, for the first time, we could go back to the Galilee, which, of course, was an incredible homecoming because, you know, no one had ever expected from our family, from our village, that we'd be able to go back home. My father was welcomed back with a dance. It was, it was huge. So a year later, our family relocated uh, to Israel. And of course, I came to Israel with these romantic notions that I was coming back home to Palestine. I wasn't coming home to Palestine. I, was, I effectively became an Israeli citizen. Uh, and I, there was nobody else like me who actually made this trip back, having grown up as a Palestinian all their life suddenly and you know, gone through the war in Lebanon and what it meant suddenly found themselves uh, an Israeli citizen having to learn Hebrew and integrate in Israeli society and start finding out what it meant to live as a Palestinian, you know, in a state that treats us as second, you know, I hesitate to even use second, it's probably third or fourth or tenth uh, class citizens. Um, with me, I have, you know, just a few of, you know, the racist laws that are constantly uh, passed uh, against us to try and, you know, marginalize the, the Palestinian uh, population and so on. 
uh, I stuck it out for eight years, and then I ran away to Canada. <laughs> I was in Canada for six years. I said, forget it. We may it. all follow you soon yeah. enough. <laughs> I said, I'm not doing this, you know, I just, I have to leave. And then, you know, I missed home, and one of my friends suggested, why don't you come back to the West Bank, to Ramallah, you could get a job, you could still be, you know, fairly near your family and so on. So I came back and I lived in Ramallah, I've been there since uh, 2009. So the thing is, I'm one of those uh, people who has this uh, view of what it means to live as a Palestinian, both in Israel and in the West Bank. Um, and one of the things that I said uh, in my essay is that, you know, as Palestinians, we feel we spend every minute of our lives in the country, paying for the fact that we're not Jewish. Um, whether it's in the West Bank or inside Israel, there is a very complex, intricate system of discrimination that's like a web around, you know, every aspect of our, of our lives. Um, and being, I mean, you know, the Colombia checkpoint uh, that Ayelet and Michael have talked about, I traverse this every time I want to go back to Israel to visit my family, to visit my friends, and, and so on. Um, I just want to uh, say something just very quickly. Uh, recently, we had, for example, a deputy Knesset speaker, uh, Betzalel Smotrich, I think that's how you say it, from Habayat Yehudi, talked about something called the subjugation plan for the West Bank, in which he says that the Palestinians, according to him, will be given three choices to leave the country, in other words, you know, for mass, mass displacement again, to live in Israel with the status of resident alien, because as he you know, noted, according to Jewish law, there must always be some inferiority, or to resist, and then, to quote him, the Israel defense forces will know what to do. Uh, when they were asked, you know, when he was asked if he was talking about genocide, he said, well, in war, you have to behave as in war. Um, and I know this must sound, you know, really shocking, but this, these kind of statements we're, we're used to, they come out all the time. You know, we have um, an organization called uh, Adela, it means justice in Arabic, this actually it documents a database of discriminatory laws that are passed by, uh, you know, or attempted to pass in the Israeli parliament against us. I mean, very briefly, the expulsion of Arab uh, members of Knesset, the other members, the, you know, the Jewish Israeli members of Knesset have the right to expel their fellow Arab uh, Knesset members. Uh, we have the foreign funding law, which says if you're an NGO working for human rights, the state of Israel can clamp down on your funding and can close your organization. We have the anti-terror law, which, you know, has a very vague definition of terror, so it allows you to be imprisoned on, you know, very spurious grounds and on something called administrative detention, in which you have you know, no rights to even know the charges that are against you uh, because of, you know, security. Uh, we have mandatory minimum sentences on convicted stone throwers, i.e. children. And we have uh, laws revoking child allowances for the parents of these children who may be as young as, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. So I think, you know, I'll finish here. Um, there's too much I can say, but, you know, I can, I can tell you that every uh, Jewish person must make an attempt I think, to visit Israel and to see both sides. It's very, very refreshing uh, being among, you know, such a crowd with, with um, so many uh, Jewish friends and Jewish people in it who are, you know, I was uh, telling Daniel earlier, who are aware of, you know, what's really going on, who, who try and make themselves more informed. Um, I think what can be done, I mean, is huge, you know, starting from... Uh, local political, you know, political, let's say, uh, awareness, you know, among people in certain areas, trying to take that up in the political system to political representatives and so on, trying to look at organizations that put pressure on Israel, whether through boycott or, you know, other ways, encouraging people uh, to come to Israel. I mean, Sam Bahur, who uh, Michael, whom Michael wrote about, uh, receives, you know, literally hundreds of Jewish delegations every year. Uh, these are people that know very little about the reality when they arrive, and he takes them on tours of the West Bank, and he shows them, you know, he, he really, it's a very, very eye-opening experience for people. So to encourage, you know, even um, other Jewish people, to encourage them to come and to see for themselves. Um, what can be done in the States? I mean, the States, you know, is one of the strongest supporters of Israel, you know, morally, politically, and financially. Any pressure that the Jewish community can put on its elected representatives and, you know, within the political sphere to try and lessen that blind support, uh, at least while Israel is, you know, is doing, is committing its, its you know, its crimes is definitely uh, the way to go because, I mean, I was having a discussion with someone earlier just feeling bad about it 
obviously isn't, you know, isn't, isn't enough. Uh, boycotting the settlements only is kind of like this whole room is on fire and I'm just worried about this chair right here. Um, the practices that you know we've spoken about today are practiced by the state of Israel. The settlements in the West Bank are only a tiny, I mean, okay, they're very impactful because they're in the West Bank and it's you know the occupation and so on, but it's the entire machine, the entire army, the machine, the government machine that perpetrates all this. And frankly, boycotting the settlements only isn't really going to cause them too much discomfort. So that's my stand.